I've talked about anthropomorphism in a previous video, in my video about how dogs don't smile and don't love you. But I learned something today and I want to talk a bit more about anthropomorphism because I think what I'm about to tell you is really important and helps to explain what we see in dog culture, in the way people relate to dogs and the beliefs they hold about dogs, which baffle us who are not in the dog cult. Whenever the subject of dog attacks comes up, dog lovers, especially pit bull advocates, love to say, it's all in how you raise them. They say this when they have no idea how the dogs that attacked were raised. They always say the dog must have been abused, mistreated, or trained to be vicious. When they have zero proof of this, and I mean zero, no evidence at all, yet they cling to these beliefs as though their lives depend on it, and they always defend the dogs. It's all in how you raise them, they say. The dog is always innocent in their eyes, even when, to any sane and rational person, it clearly isn't innocent. Uh, why do people do this? Why can't people see dogs, especially pit bull type dogs, and other powerful breeds such as Rottweilers, Huskies, German Shepherds, and others that are known for savagely attacking, disfiguring, and killing people in unprovoked attacks. Why can't people see these dogs for what they are? These dogs are unpredictable, instinct-driven, remorseless, bloodthirsty carnivores that can snap at any time. They are all ticking time bombs. It doesn't matter how you raise them. The evidence shows that dogs raised in loving homes are attacking unprovoked every day. And why most people cannot see this totally baffles me. But I learned something today that might explain what is going on. I watched a video posted on Facebook by Big Think. I'll put the link in the description for you. It's called Dead Penguin Sex, The Reason You Shouldn't Anthropomorphize Animals. Lucy Cook, a zoologist and National Geographic presenter, also author of The Truth About Animals, gives a short talk in which she explains how we like to portray the animal kingdom in human terms. In many popular stories, she says, animals are behaving like us. Animals on television have nice nuclear family setups. It's fascinating how this desire to see animals behaving in a nice, moral, Christian family values way is something we have been propagating for millennia, she says. She talks about the medieval bestiaries. Bestiaries were illustrated books that described various animals. The natural history and illustration of each beast was usually accompanied by a moral lesson. These books were written by religious scribes, and they all copied one book, which was the Physiologus, which was yeah, a collection of moralized beast tales, which was written in the 4th century. The Physiologus popularized natural history and took it to the masses, she explains. She says it was the second most popular book after the Bible. It was hugely popular. The physiologus, along with the bestiaries, were not interested in telling the truth about animals or enlightening their audience. That was not the purpose of these books. Uh, people believed God had implanted moral lessons in animals to teach us. The stories they told in these books about animals were very moral. Animals were good or they were bad. They taught us lessons about what's sinful and what isn't. She thinks we peddle these same myths and are doing the same thing today. And I agree with her. Popular press and newspapers, TV, uh, they do the same thing. She gives the example of a news story about a stork that returned to its partner after many years and 
talks about how it was portrayed as this kind of love affair, very humanized. People like to see these sorts of heroic, feel-good, Christian values stories. Uh, people like to have these stories told. And uh, it's interesting how she explains it. She explains that the risk of anthropomorphizing animals in this way is that we fail to understand them. We don't appreciate them for what they are. Uh, I'll just let you listen to a part of the clip. Here it is. We just will fail to understand them. We won't appreciate them on their own terms for what they are. To paint the animal kingdom with a, with a Christian moral brush is to deny it in its, all of its sort of sibling-eating, um, you know, blood-sucking, corpse-shagging glory, you know. And, and the thing is, is we, we, we shouldn't be afraid of animals to behave as they do in these uh, ways that are, are maybe even morally repugnant to us. They're not there to teach us a lesson. They're just there to live their lives. If we want moral guidance, we should be looking inside of ourselves for that. We shouldn't be looking to a penguin, for example, to tell us how to teach our lives. Or a dog. No, but you're probably thinking, oh, penguins are really cute and they're monogamous and they make for life. Well, actually, um, that's not true either. Penguins are birds with small brains that live in a very brutal environment. They have a short window in which to reproduce and so they're flooded with hormones and the males particularly the Adeli penguin which is your, your classic little black and white penguin the males are pumped full of hormones and so they'll basically have sex with anything that moves and quite a few things that don't move like dead penguins so uh penguins uh nefarious sexual activity was first discovered by a member of Scott's Antarctic uh, team and he was so horrified by what he saw that he encoded his observations of penguin sexual behavior in Greek in his notebook lest they fell into the wrong hands and then he and his, his the diaries are absolutely hilarious to read because he starts off and he's there observing the penguins and he's like oh look at them they're so lovely they're like little children they're so cute and then after uh, after a few days with them he starts writing about how there are gangs of hooligan cocks whose passions seem to have gone beyond their control and who are who are abusing chicks before the eyes of their parents you know and this sort of you know thoroughly appalling sexual behavior that's that's taking place and of course this is this is just penguins being penguins they you know they have this very short window in which to breed it just makes sense that they they're flooded with hormones and and they're, they're programmed to to have you know fairly indiscriminate sex so you know it, it's not for us to to make moral judgments about but um when levick came back from the antarctic with his observations on penguins he took them to the natural history museum in england who published the first sort of definitive book about um, penguin behavior but they refused to publish their sexual behavior that chapter was not included and instead it was printed up as a separate document um and circulated amongst a few learned people who were able to, to cope with this and, um, and stamped not for publication and lost to science for 100 years. Because we don't want penguins to behave like that. We want penguins to be cuddly, fluffy, lovely, monogamous, sweet little animals. But uh, they're not. You know how she describes the way people want to see penguins as these fluffy, cute, adorable birds? Uh, I think people are doing the same thing with dogs. They want to see dogs as these fluffy, cute, adorable, smiling, uh, you know, pure, innocent, loving creatures. And just as people in the Middle Ages and even today are not really wanting to look at the truth about penguins, they don't want to look at the truth about dogs either. They don't want to accept it. Uh, and you know how she talks about the the media and TV and how they talked about the stork story and referred to it as a love affair. You know, the way they humanize other animals, they do the same with dogs in the media. 
uh, TV, movies, thing, you know, and this has been going on for such a long time. Snoopy, Scooby-Doo, Benji, Paw Patrol, Clifford the Big Red Dog. Uh, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, you can just think of so many examples where dogs are not portrayed realistically. You know, dogs are not able to solve mysteries and fight crime. And, you know, we just uh, we put all these human qualities onto them, which they they don't have. They are not human. But why do we do this? This goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years, as she explains. We, we are so used to doing it. I just found this really, really fascinating. And I think when it comes to pit bull advocacy, you know, when you think about how, you know, Michael Vick and how he was busted for dog fighting back in 2007, I believe, uh, I think it was around that time that this whole pit bull craze really kicked in. And people all started wanting pit bulls and they were all being pushed on us as great dogs. Uh, I think it's because the pit bull is serving as a symbol uh, it, like for this moral story. The moral of the story is if a dog is mistreated and abused, it's going to be vicious and aggressive and dangerous. Whereas if you love the dog uh, and raise it properly, it will become a loyal, you know, unconditionally loving companion. Uh, and I think that's the story here on the pit bull. It's like attached to it, this moral story, and people are just gobbling it up. Um, they're not seeing the dog for what it is. They are totally denying its genetics. They are totally irrational. Uh, you know, not they're in denial about what this, what these dogs were bred for, and what they are capable of, which is sudden and unpredictable, explosive aggression. Anyhow, um, they are in love with that story of, uh, you know, especially rescuing. You know, Michael Vick's dogs were, you know, rescued by other people who were so loving with them and provided them with so much care and love that they, you know, they rewarded the owners with, you know, unconditional love. And uh, it turned out to be the sweetest dogs. Um, so that makes people feel good you know that the heroic story of saving of rescuing um you know such a great moral to that story and that whole thing that that story is something that i think a lot of people really don't want to give up for some reason they're they're so attached to it it makes them feel so good or it serves some sort of primal need um I don't know, or is it a Christian thing? Uh, what do you think? I think we're really onto something with this. I really wonder if uh, this lady, um, Lucy Cook, is a dog owner, uh, and if she can see dogs for what they really are. I talked to you guys about a friend of mine, a very good friend who's a dog owner, and she's different from most dog people because she sees her dogs for what they are. She's not in denial at all. So, uh, yeah. Let me know what you think about this in the comments. I thought this was really interesting. So we need to quit anthropomorphizing animals. And uh, yeah, we just need to talk about this. Talk about how we're doing this in our society. So maybe people can recognize that, yeah, they're doing this. And uh, maybe this is just one way we can chip away uh, and get to their core beliefs about dogs. Because this is one layer of the onion that uh, is really difficult to deny. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Please like and share. And uh, remember, the future is dog-free.